thank you all for staying. Um, and I think all of us are excited about uh, learning more about the images and the web telescope. So thanks to Kevin for being willing at the last moment to kind of have some conversation. The other thing that, that Kevin said is if people are interested, he would be willing to do a more in-depth um, conversation in the fall. So um, think about that, um, and I'll turn it over to Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Good morning. Can everyone hear? Is this helping, the amplification? Okay, so uh, let me begin by saying what you're looking at is actually not the web telescope. <laughs> the web telescope. This is a radio astronomy telescope that's uh, uh, secured firmly here on Earth that's also looking at the night sky and it's actually been an important way of understanding the universe. Uh, what's interesting about this one also is it actually looks a little bit like the Webb Telescope's primary mirror in that it has a, a big dish. <laughs> the dish for the, the Webb Telescope is around 20 feet across. Uh, it has actually a collection of segments, 18 segments in all, that make up that big mirror. Uh, and it has, this one has a secondary mirror. It's got some struts. You'll actually see some artifacts of that in the image. Go ahead. Okay. And uh, um, so let's go on to look at some images from the uh, actual <coughs> web telescope. We're looking at deep space. <laughs> All right. Okay, this is one of the uh, uh, five sets of data that have been released by, by the uh, Web Telescope team. Um, so, just to say a few more words about the telescope. This telescope was the creation of probably um, 10,000 people. Speak up just a little bit. Yep. How's that? Yeah. Great. I'll keep it right here. Uh, about 10,000 people worked on this over the course of approximately 20 years. This is around a $10 billion uh, uh, telescope. It was conceived actually in the 80s, just around the time that they were really finishing and getting the Hubble ready for launch. Uh, and they've been working on it, frankly, since then. There's a lot of technologies. It works in a slightly different spectral range than Hubble. And so, although we see colors that are in our visual uh, perception, that's a color encoding because all the colors that we see in the web telescope, are, most of them are shifted uh, uh, into the infrared. So this is a, an infrared telescope and therefore it actually has to be very cold. So this telescope is purposely placed a million miles away. It's in an orbit that's between us and the sun. Uh, it is um, uh, at what is a gravitational point called L2, which means it will stay out there. Uh, and, and so we knew we couldn't fix it. We had to get it right the first time. And, and so uh, it was very, very extensively tested on the ground. Um, it was so big it wouldn't fit inside of any rocket that we have. And, and so we had to, uh, what was developed was a way to unfold the mirror, to fold it up more tightly and then to unfold it when it was on orbit. And not only the mirrors had to fold, but a giant sun shield had to fold uh, and be stowed away and, and so all of this had to be unwrapped when it got into orbit. So it was launched uh, just around Christmas time, and during the first number of weeks, it was slowly unfolding itself into what has been christened the Origami Telescope. <laughs> so it was very carefully, uh, you know, each step along the way, we were all sort of on pins and needles because there were more than 300 single points of failure in this device. If that had, uh, you know, if any one of those had failed, the device would not have uh, been able to function in some capacity. Uh, most of them would have been severe. That is, it wouldn't have unfurled at all. <coughs> so it is now operating at about 30 degrees above absolute zero. The main telescope, the the eyes of the telescope, the detectors are around uh, uh, 10 degrees above absolute zero. So they're very cold. This is the way one gets really, really sensitive detectors. Uh, uh, in this particular spectral range. So the colors this thing sees range from the, the, the very shortest wavelength end of the spectrum it sees is around the red color in, as our eyes perceive it. And then it stretches out, three of the instruments have uh, um, uh, sensitivity out to about five micrometers, so about 10 times longer wavelength than, than the, our visible range. 
and then one of the cameras actually sees out to uh, 20 microns, uh, 20 micrometers. And that's important because all these different colors actually have different amounts of information. What we're looking at now is um, a portion of what's called the deep field. This is one of the images that uh, um, uh, was taken over around 12 hours of staring time to collect all the light that comes back. And we're seeing uh, the, the galaxies in the near field. Some of the bright white splotches are, are actually galaxies. First of all, the, the brightest thing in the scene, these hexagonal star cross patterns, those are near field uh, uh, stars in our own uh, galaxy. And so for us, that's a spectacular pattern. And for the astronomers, it's just noise. <laughs> so I ignore those. <laughs> um, the next most brilliant things are the, the, the white galaxies uh, that you can actually see in the image. I like this one in particular. And it's, uh, in the upper right, there's a beautiful rendition of a spiral galaxy. That one is probably around 5 billion light years away. That's sort of the mid-range for this, for this particular view. So we're looking back in time. The speed of light is very fast for our everyday purposes. It's, you know, things happen almost instantaneously. But um, it takes minutes for the light to get from us, from the sun to us. It takes five billion year, years for the light from the whitest objects in, the, in this scene to get uh, uh, to us. And for the very dimmest, reddest objects, they're closer to the edge of the universe. And, and so they're red shifted, that's why they're that color. Um, and, and those objects could be as much as 10 billion light years away. I believe there's one small red speck that the astronomer, astronomy community say that's the furthest object we've ever seen with a, with a telescope like this. That's in one of these images. Yes, Andy? What does red shifted? Red shifted. So we've all had the experience of a, a, a car with a horn honking goes by us. It, uh, you know, it sounds like it's higher pitched when it's coming towards us, and then it's uh, lower pitched after it passes. Okay, that's a Doppler shift in audio, in our audio range. Okay, light does something similar, uh, and basically all the galaxies are receding from one another. So the universe is expanding, and so if you look far enough away, you're also looking at colors that are shifting. And they're always shifted to the red, uh, um, except for some galaxies, some stars very near to us that actually might come in, becoming uh, closer to us. We actually see a few of those blue shifted stars, but nearly everything else is red shifted. And some of these are red shifted by an amazing amount. Uh, um, there's another very interesting thing happening uh, in this image. Uh, you see all these stretched red things? Those are galaxies whose uh, radiation, whose pattern has been distorted by gravitation. And so this is a phenomenon that's referred to as gravitational lensing. And, and so some of these galaxies actually look like sort of mirrored images of one another. They are. That's what actually the distortion of gravity is giving us two views of the same galaxy in some cases, but at slightly, with uh, slightly different properties and slightly different positions. And so this is, um, from matter that's between us and these galaxies being so strong that it actually bends the light. This is something that Einstein predicted back around the, the turn of the 20th century and was confirmed experimentally by looking at the light bending you know, from Mercury, bending around the sun. Well, this is this happening at uh, 10 billion light years instead of uh, 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 just a, a few hundred million miles. And so they're stretched. Some people are saying this almost looks like a Salvador Dali painting, where we have these galaxies stretched out over, over space. Uh, Kevin, I mean, we're looking at those, but there's a good possibility since it's been 10 billion years ago that some of those don't even exist anymore. Oh, very strong possibility. So do they take photos at certain times and sort of trace to see what's appearing and disappearing? Well, so you're always in look back time when you're looking through a telescope. And, and so the problem is, is that. Yes, if we're around 10 billion years from now, we'll be see, uh, you know, we, and maybe even a few billion years. So we might actually, if we were to last that long, see the extinguishing of several of these galaxies. That's possible. <laughs> well, let's see what else. Uh, uh, okay, I think um, how much of the sky is this? That's another really interesting point. So this is a portion of the field. It's about uh, a quarter. Um, 
Each dimension is around a quarter of the total field of view of this particular image. But that image is a very small piece of the sky. And it's been likened to, if you hold a grain of sand at arm's length, that's the size, that's the, uh, let's call it the angle that is subtended by that image. So this is a really, really small soda straw that we're looking through. And in this total image, we see thousands of objects, thousands of galaxies in this, in this tiny piece of the sky. And so that uh, um, means that we're uh, in a universe with uh, hundreds of billions of galaxies. Yes? Uh, that's another bright near field star. <laughs> hmm? There's the. Okay, so let's go on to the next. Uh, if there are any other questions on this one, let's go on to the next image. Okay, great. Okay, so this is uh, a, an object that's actually in our galaxy. It's called the uh, Southern Ring Nebula. Uh, and of course, we've been looking at this with our uh, optical telescopes like the Hubble for some time. Uh, and if you look at the image on the left, you see there's a bright star in the middle of this gas cloud, but it's a bluish star. So that actually had people confused it, uh, astronomers, astronomers confused as to what was going on, because these nebulae tend to be what is the remnant of an exploded star, or the remnant of a star that is uh, sending out vast amounts of material into space, which is then excited and growing. But bright blue stars don't do that. And, and so now, in the image on the right, we actually are now looking at a different color. So the image on the left was taken in, with, uh, the, in what was referred to as the near-infrared portion of the spectrum uh, by an instrument called NearCam. The image on the right is the mid-infrared imagery. And so it's seeing light from five micrometers out to uh, 20 micrometers and it's actually seeing more of the infrared signal. And so the, the, near the bright star, there's a second dimmer star that's red. That's the star that's dying. So in this image, we actually see uh, a, a star death happening. Uh, it'll actually happen over thousands of years. Our star will do this too. So there'll be a time in its life cycle when it starts sending out bursts of gas deep into space. Every few thousand years, it'll probably send out another burst. And eventually it, it will, uh, uh, you know, could uh, uh, expand to the point where it reaches Earth and, and uh, turn into eventually this particular star, a uh, um, sort of a dim red star that, uh, you know, continues to die until it loses all of its intensity. So uh, that second star, the one on the left, is, is actually in that uh, uh, stage of life. It's actually further on than we are. And uh, uh, it, you can almost see a little bit that over time, it's sending out a different burst. So you can see little ripples as it, as it proceeds from the center of the image. So let's go on to the next image. Ah, this is a very close image of, of a better uh, view of uh, uh, the uh, uh, mid-infrared image. Um, and one of the things that we actually see with the web is uh, we're looking at the infrared, we actually see less scatter, which is actually why we actually have clearer images than we have in other telescopes. And, and so uh, even though there is still plenty of uh, gaseous glow, there would actually be more if you looked in other telescopes. In fact, if you looked at this one in the Hubble, you'd see much more of a blur. And, and so we're actually seeing a lot more structure of this gas field as it's expanding because of the colors in which we're looking. Okay, this is a, uh, a famous galaxy cluster. And uh, it's theorized that two of these actually came almost uh, to the point of colliding. And there's a sort of a brilliant uh, reddish portion in the field that's actually thought to be where the uh, galaxies had closest approach. And now they're receding from one another again. Um, that will happen to us too. We're uh, in the galactic neighborhood of the uh, Andromeda galaxy. Well. In about a billion years, uh, if uh, the galaxies keep on track, the galaxy that we're in now and the Andromeda will pass through one another. Okay. That's what's happening. You know, something like that is happening here. Uh, this is a group of galaxies called Stefan's Cluster. Three of them are, or four of them are around 
uh, you know, five billion light years away. And what we see in the image on the left is, uh, um, thanks to the clarity of which we're able to see in this color, we actually see bright areas that are uh, uh, star cluster formation. And so one of the jobs of Webb is to try to help us understand stellar evolution. How does uh, the galaxy evolve, or how do galaxies evolve? How do the star pieces of that evolve? And, and you see the bright regions are, and think of them as stellar nurseries. If we were to look at this in another color, uh, again, we'd see a white blob. And here we're able to see uh, uh, the bright regions within the galaxy that are the active areas of star formation. Let's go on to the uh, next image. Uh, so we talked a little bit about star formation, and that's happening in spades in this particular image. This is called the Carina Nebula. This is one of the largest nebulas in our galaxy. Um, and so this one may be around 5,000 light years away. Um, but we can see uh, um, you know, a lot of structure showing us where the, the, uh, the gas is more compact than not. And, and so one of the things to think about is when you look at these images, you're seeing life, uh, birth, and death simultaneously in the image. We're seeing uh, um, in these gas fields the mass that came out of exploded stars in the past. But that same mass can be gathered again by gravity and concentrated and, uh, um, into a new star. And, and so we're in a star orbiting a star that's uh, probably a third generation star. The first stars that uh, were uh, uh, evolved after the Big Bang were primarily hydrogen and helium. They didn't have the materials to make us. And so you actually needed to have stellar explosions, supernovae, and, uh, that created the energy necessary to form uh, atoms of higher atomic weight than iron. So if you get a natural uh, um, a normal star, in fact, even our own, uh, as soon as it starts uh, burning up everything except iron, it stops. And so that will actually be one of the death of those of our star. One of the, the big stars actually explode, and during that explosion, you create other kinds of material, higher atomic number elements, the stuff that we need, actually, that's necessary for our bodies to function. We have all kinds of elements that are heavier than, than, than iron. And so in order to have those, we needed a universe that it's had enough time to evolve so that it went through about two to three cycles of these stellar birth and death and explosions that went with the death. And so we're actually seeing a fair amount of that within this image. Uh, again, we see the bright near-field stars, uh, but uh, the things that are very exciting to the uh, astronomical community are the bright regions within this, this cloud that are again the areas of uh, star formation. Yes, John? The um, colors are beautiful. And did someone pick the color star? Is there an algorithm for why the color is what it is? Well, so I don't know precisely what uh, you know the color assignment is, but in general, what they've tried to do is shift what we see in, in our own spectrum and shift it into the infrared. And so the, the shortest wavelength colors are the bluest ones uh, uh, that show up here. The, the longest wavelength colors are the ones that show up in, uh, in the reddest portion of the image here. And so that's how they've chosen to code it. It's just a shifting and potentially a stretching of the wavelength spectrum that we normally see. Now, uh, what did we get with our extra $10 billion uh, that Hubble could not have seen? <laughs> Hubble can see a lot of this. You can actually see, you know, let's call it the main structure. But if you look in a Hubble image, um, you actually see a lot more areas that look like there's fog in front of them. And, and you could not see the areas of, uh, uh, you know, uh, intense uh, uh, new star formation. And, and so, again, what we're seeing when we have a telescope like this is we're seeing through the dust and gas that's in between much more, much better because we're using uh, the, uh, uh, infrared wavelengths. Uh, and let's go on to the next chart. There's, if there's, is that it? I think that's what I have. Okay, so there's one more image that they did not, uh, um, that's not in this set. It's not actually an image of a two dimensional uh, picture, it's a spectrogram. And this spectrogram was a t um, uh, acquired over around 12 hours while the telescope watched 
one particular star and it watched uh, a hot Jupiter, a planet, an exoplanet, wander through that uh, field. So it, it did what astro the astronomers call a transit. And so it just passed right in front of that sun. And so we can watch what the light curve, what the, all the colors look like while this particular planet is passing through the field of view. And so what does that give us? Well, we can break that light into many colors. This is the kind of instrument I work on, which I want to talk about. <laughs> the spectrogram reveals the chemical structure of materials that are in, in the cloud. And in particular, what we see is unmistakable evidence of water being in the atmosphere of this exoplanet. And so one of the jobs of Webb is to actually look at the uh, um, uh, formation and characterization of exoplanets. We won't be able to image planets directly, even with a telescope this big, but we can actually uh, get views of what's in their atmosphere, and that will tell us, among other things, whether that's a possible location for uh, our life to have evolved, because we know that uh, basically life of any form that, as we understand it, requires water. And so we're looking for, particularly for planets that have water in their atmosphere. Can this spectrogram also show you some of the other elements that might be there too? Sure. Okay. So then you'd have more information as far as potential life. That's right. Would require the same right. elements. But by all, you know, the most important of those, uh, are, you know, the, the those searching for extraterrestrial life are primarily looking for water because without that, there's, there's no hope. And this is a hot Jupiter, so I wouldn't actually go hunting for life on this particular planet for other reasons. <laughs> it's a hot Jupiter. It's actually a planet uh, uh, similar in size to Jupiter, but it's much closer to its sun than our Jupiter is, and therefore it would be a particularly inhospitable place for life as, as we know it. But it's the kind of thing that we'll look for as, uh, you know, in these uh, other images. And so these are just a handful of the images that they've collected so far. But they were very careful in the kinds of things that they were trying to, to view. If we go back to the, um, so they particularly wanted to understand stellar evolution. And they wanted to understand stellar dynamics. And in this image, um, we really wanted to, to do what was actually done almost as, um, it was a gamble when it was done with Hubble the first time. Most of the time, the telescope observing time of these space-based observatories is so valuable, you really have to know what, go, go in knowing what you're after. You have to say, ah, we've seen that object before with another telescope. We need to explore it in greater detail with this special new one. This kind of image is different. This was actually pointed at, a, you know, when they did this with Hubble, they pointed it at a region of sky that was nothing in particularly special. We didn't know anything was going to be. We just said, well, look far enough back in time and for a long enough period of time to see what's there. They did this first with the Hubble Deep Field around a decade ago, and it just blew everybody's mind. It was, uh, there were plenty of people said, that was a waste of time to do such an image. And others said, let's try it. They tried it. It worked. They're doing it again with Webb, and it's working even better. It's not, it's not our Jupiter. It's another, it's a planet around another star. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we can see some of its additional composition. Uh, we actually know its mass because we can actually, for these exoplanets, we can get actually a lot of information just by uh, watching the transit curve. How, we know how big it is, for instance. And we know that it's the size, more or less, of our, our, uh, our Jupiter as opposed to a tiny planet like Earth. It's just closer to its sun than uh, um, our Jupiter is to our sun. <coughs> yes, sir? How long does it take to get an image? Are we talking minutes or hours? So this is a 12-hour image. So but, that's what we might expect every 12 hours we can get a new image if they reposition it? Well, not all the images are going to require the same amount of exposure time. I think the deep field images are, are exceptions. Um, also, the, the planetary transit, uh, we actually have to look far enough uh, or, or long enough in time for the, for the transit to occur. And so in that particular case, the transit time was around 12 hours. 
And so what they'll hope to do is actually observe uh, many of the objects of interest with uh, far shorter exposure times because then you can actually see more objects. But these deep fields, they take that kind of time. Kevin, I think there's two parts to that question. And how long it takes to take the picture and how long it takes for the picture to get from the telescope back here to Earth. Okay, um, so the amount of, so this, uh, a million miles is a fair distance, but they have a fairly good communication bandwidth, and so they'll, I suspect it's minutes to get the uh, image uh, once collected, uh, uh, transmitted. It's not going to be instantaneous, but it's going to be relatively short. So most of the time is actually spent collecting the image as opposed to waiting for it to show up. And also, one might say, what's the hurry? <laughs> that is, what you really want to do is not lose any of the data. <laughs> If you have to wait a little bit of time to get there, you know, that's okay. But, uh, uh, but the exposure time, that's precious, and, and uh, it's also necessary. Barbara? Since, we, since you understand the causal lensing effect, are they going to like recalculate to represent these images at some point, or is that possible? I don't know. I think they can, um, you'd have to know enough about the original shape, uh, because what we see are the different versions of the distorted shape. So I don't know if you can fully recover it. Uh, you can make, you know, estimates. Well, this looks like a normal elliptical galaxy. You know, what should its shape be? But you know, th that will be uh, um, an imperfect process. So unfortunately, you know, to some extent, this is what it is. That is, you know, we're, we don't have enough time, and we don't have enough a different position we can look at it from in order to to see how it might appear in, in different angles. Perhaps, how long will the uh, work um, the telescope stay in service? Is it forever or at some point it's... Well, it will um, eventually, it does re require some fuel to maintain its position. Um, and, and uh, you know, it has electronics that will not live forever. Yeah, the hope is that it will actually last 20 years. Yeah. yeah. But, and they built it with uh, uh, lots of high reliability electronics and with long life in mind, so they basically built it as well as we know how, but uh, I don't think anybody expects it to live quite forever. Um, uh, Hubble has actually done an amazing job, but uh, keep in mind, we've actually serviced that multiple times now, and, and so it's, it's a 30 year telescope, but it's got a, you know, maybe a 10 year old engine. Yes, Doug? Yeah, uh, Jordy and Star Trek had a miser with the ability to see beyond the visible. Uh -huh. <laughs> is this infrared our best shot, or is there another spectrum of energy that might even be better? Well, so you look for where the energy of the processes are. And for a lot of these stellar processes, this is a really good region to be looking at. Um, we can actually look at longer wavelengths. In fact, we do all the time. Our radio telescopes the wavelength of light that a radio telescope sees is, is uh, uh, a thousand times longer than the wavelengths that we're looking at in, in these images. Uh, and so we actually see some of our most distant objects, quasars, we see them in microwave. Some of you may have seen uh, uh, images, what look like a, it's a, it's a black hole image. Well, of course, you don't see the black hole. What you're seeing is the bright region around the black hole the event horizon. We're actually seeing that in microwave images because what's, uh, that's used a collection of microwave telescopes from around the world coordinated their observations to make that image. And so we're, we're looking at the colors, of the, um, let's call it the processes, the physical processes uh, are, are best presented. In that particular case, they were looking at uh, the hydrogen emissions uh, uh, in the microwave region as a way of uh, getting the signal. Here we're looking at the thermal infrared because, uh, you know, like our bright star, our, our sun has a peak in its emission at around 500 nanometers. There's a number. Okay. Well, these images are at longer wavelengths than that, um, uh, as much as uh, uh, five microns. Why? Because of the redshift. But we're still trying to look at the kinds of light that emerges from the uh, you know the, the star making the star processes and, and a lot of that is 
you know, for us that are close by this star, it's in the visible band, much of the light is. There's some in the infrared, some in the ultraviolet, but most of it's in the visible. For, for these images, a lot, of the image, a lot of the energy is in the uh, uh, thermal infrared portion, which is why we use this telescope. Yes? So do the, and I might have missed this, um, you mentioned that the red one, the red plot is red because of the red shift including the wave. So do the different shadings from red through you know, yellow and purple indicate the amount, like the amount of red shift or the speed at which they're moving away? Yes, and both. The, the red so, so the, the things that are reddest are also the ones moving away from us the fastest. Right. Okay. Do you ever have people say you're crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Of course, what's your point? <laughs> just believing that we actually walked on the moon. I can see people say it five billion years ago or whatever. Well, so I've been in science for you know all my working career, and, and you have too. And so um, what we work on is evidence. This is now at least evidence that's that's available to your eyes. Look at this. This is evidence that would not be available to our eyes. But we know how to uh, uh, make these observations uh, using other means. When Newton first discovered infrared radiation, uh, it was actually apparent to him how he used it. He actually used what amounts to a spectrograph. We talked about that. Um, that was what he had in mind at the time. But, but what he was noticing is that there was uh, a region that was bright. It was pulling in light from the sun through a prism. There was regions that, that he could see, and actually he could see a dispersion of the colors. Um, uh, and so it would be you know, a little, little bit of rainbow out of the sunlight. That was interesting. But then he also noticed something else. He noticed that if he were to put something that would be collecting heat and, and getting warm, he was getting something that was generating heat to the right of where the sunlight was hitting. I'm making it up the direction, I don't know which one. But but the idea is, what he was seeing is the effect of infrared radiation, which is this. Uh, it was true, we didn't have the eyeballs with the uh, uh, receptors to see it, but the radiation was still there. And so this building up of evidence using other means uh, is uh, the, you know, the basis of science. And so, uh, you know, uh, we're all living proof, I think, these days that uh, uh, so much of modern medicine would be unimaginable without uh, uh, the developments of science. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure I wouldn't be alive and there were many of us that would have had something else kill them long before we got to this stage of life. Right. So it, it's uh, you know, this understanding of evidence. And then here, um, this is building on the work of thousands of people uh, in the astronomy community over hundreds of years of time. Uh, Galileo, uh, the um, understanding of that these different things, that you, you know, different versions of Venus that you see as you look in the night sky were because the planet was moving and it was moving around the sun in a certain way uh, and reflecting the light in a certain way. And he was building on the ideas of Copernicus, who first thought this was a much more sensible way for the universe to work, uh, having uh, planets go around the sun as opposed to us being at the center of the universe. That took both a combination of uh, creative uh, thought processes, but also looking at the evidence in front of them. Um, and, and so this collection of evidence uh, has gotten better <laughs> as uh, this kind of uh, uh, telescope has, uh, I think, proven uh, spectacularly. We have gotten much better at understand, uh, building instruments to help us understand the world, uh, help us understand the universe. And from Copernicus on, they were called crazy. So of course. Surprisingly, someone called and, and he was a little afraid of them. He didn't actually publish his work until it was published after he died. Galileo was not shy. He said, no, I see this. Um, and uh, he uh, had some penalties in his uh, career as a consequence. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, that's a long dialogue. There's some great books written on this. <laughs> um, and you know, we see it even carrying on today. 
And so I, I think that, that uh, you know, God's given us a great universe to understand. This is terrific. But he's also given us the, the intelligence and ways in which we can understand this universe and, and make sense of it and then make decisions accordingly. So, you know, that's how I view it. And Yes? I know that there was a picture where they pointed where the arch was where they got a picture of some of the moons. Yeah. Does I see that too. Mm -hmm. have a focal length short enough that you can help us find the planet 9 if it's out there? Because <laughs> uh, Hubble, I know, is too far. You know, they can't help because it's designed to look too far away. I don't know if you actually have a near field problem with the. <coughs> I think. I don't know if there's any need for a focus shift in order to for this to look at something that close. Um, one thing about this device that uh, um, Hubble didn't have is that um, the mirror, the primary mirror, is composed of 18 segments because we knew we couldn't build a 25th mirror, let alone launch it in any rocket that we had. And, and so we built this mirror. I'm saying we. It's the community built this mirror out of one and a half meter hexagons. Okay. Each of those one and a half meter hexagons is a very precise, tele, you know, forms a very precise telescope image all of its own. So we can actually, and in fact, this was used in the alignment process. We had to understand where each of those segments was pointed. Everybody knew that all the shaking, rattling, and rolling you do during launch would disturb this. And so the plan all along was to go in and use actuators to move those segments ever, ever so precisely, being able to rotate them, tilt them, twist them, in order to realign them into a perfect image once again. This means we actually have the ability to do fine focus adjustments with this device if we so care to. I don't know if that's what they want to do and if they have evidence for it. One of the things that they were trying to do with this, this uh, set of the, uh, Jupiter images was actually see how quickly they could take an image because they want to be able to take movies. And they wanted to demonstrate that they could actually collect images in a rapid fire phase, a rapid fire sequence in order to allow them to you know, basically collect video. And they believe that they can do that. And so if we actually do end up with fast moving objects, we've got the, the best eye in the sky ever to potentially look at that. Yay. How the theologian's reaction to this? I haven't heard any of that. <laughs> um, I, I will say that uh, um, some years ago, my, my wife and I are in a book group, and about a decade and a half ago, we read yeah. a book by the, uh, uh, a, the uh, now, person who's now the uh, astronomer at the Vatican, the lead astronomer at the Vatican. And, and he was, he would be thrilled with this. He would be terrific. <laughs> That is, uh, you know, science uh, and many in the Jesuit community have been interested in, uh, uh, in science even in Galileo's time. And so science has been nothing to be afraid of for in, uh, at least major portions of the theological community ever. I think there might be a few that are disturbed that once again we don't seem to have a 5,000 year old universe with, Earth, with uh, uh, the Earth at the center. But I don't hear about that too often. <laughs> I also don't think it's necessary for that. I don't see any incompatibility between uh, you know, the Christian faith that, that we've received and, and what we're seeing here. So you know, these are different spheres of life as far as I'm concerned. And uh, what we've learned by faith, grants and the sons. What's the meaning of life? Is the telescope going to tell us that? Well, no, uh, it's not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, showing us what's out there and in ever greater detail and helping us, helping us understand this, um, I, I think is what it can do. Does that change how we see our place in the universe? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, just thinking about us being in one galaxy among what may be nearly a trillion galaxies in the universe is uh, somewhat humbling. <laughs> it also seems exciting. There must be more life out there somewhere, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And, and this royal uh, astronomer of the Vatican would point out, uh, somebody asked him, what would Jesus say about this? And, and he'd say, Jesus would be very interested. Would, would, they, have, would they have their own Jesus? And, and uh, this guy, Tom Solano, says, I don't know. 
Maybe they need one. <laughs> Sounds like they need a bigger welcome mat. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I have to quote Mary Norman here because it just came up. So Mary Norman is a Christian, um, I guess this one was the first Christian rock and roll artist, um, passed away some years ago, but he has in mind one of his songs that says, and if there's life on other planets, I'm sure that he must know. And he's been there once already in the sky to save their souls. <laughs> well, that was awesome. Thanks, everybody.